Um, hi, everyone. Um, I suspect you're all proper tired. Um, so thanks a lot for coming along. It's the end of a hackathon. I used to do these things a lot uh, a while ago, so I kind of know exactly where you're at at the moment. Um, also mindful of the fact that I sent the lineup today to my friends last night. It said it looks like the lineup to a club, and it does. There's like talks. I think cypherpunk super jurisdictions is the coolest name for a talk ever. An introduction to quadratic voting isn't. <laughs> I promise it's going to be a little bit more interesting than an introduction. In fact, where I want to take it is, I, I, you're all hackers, right? You're all probably heard of quadratic voting. Can you give me a show of hands if you've heard of quadratic voting prior today? See, I'm, you're probably all thinking I'm just going to teach you the very basics of what it is. Um, what I, where I want it to go, and my little subtitle here, is towards a DAO democracy. So what I'm super interested in, and what we're building at Factory DAO, is a kind of public good protocol for launching DAOs. So that means launching tokens, but it also means doing voting. It means governance. It means creating a context where people can govern themselves without being able to be stopped, uh, to be autonomous, right? So it's going to be a bit more of an introduction, a bit more than an introduction. Um, quick intro to me. Um, I'm a physicist by background. I was a scientist for 10 years. Um, I kind of realized experimental physics wasn't for me and then left and did some maths teaching, which is where I discovered cryptography. So I was teaching cryptography in around 2010, 2011, where I first sort of come across Bitcoin and it's lingered in my mind for many years, but it was the DAO when the DAO happened. That's when my life sort of changed and I realized I needed to be in crypto full time. Um, in that sort of period, I was working in education, learning theory. I got particularly interested in collective intelligence, institutional governance. Um, I was sort of building decentralized organizations in around 2013. Ooh, we've lost the screen. Um, and yeah, basically around 2020, sort of DeFi summer, I left academia after like nearly 20 years of it and set up a crypto project, uh, which was a prediction market. And one of the uh, things about prediction markets that what got me really excited about them was a paper by Ralph Merkel called, called DAOs and Democracy, DAOs, Governance and Democracy. And um, I still believe in this idea of futarchy, right, where there's a future where markets and governance mix and all these kind of things. And we're on the road to that. And what I've been building for the last two years was a prediction market that uses quadratic voting. So typically in a prediction market, you get a kind of what's going to happen, what's the price, is Bitcoin going to be above 30K or below 30K at some point in time? Um, with quadratic voting, you can, instead of saying up or down, you can weight your preferences across, across a, a whole basket of realities, right? So instead of saying which of these things, yes or no, you can have a more nuanced outcome. And that's why I think makes it super interesting. And throughout the last two years, we built some stuff for launching our token. We built a, something, uh, a liquidity bootstrapping mechanism for auctioning tokens. We bought an NFT launching system. I think we were one of the first people to do NFT governance, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and we've built a snapshot-like system, which you're all using um, to vote on the open track here at this conference. So you'll notice there's a few twists to it, and I'll get to that. Um, but really where we've got to is we've sort of realized we've got an application suite that we can help as many people as possible to launch DAOs. So I'm just completely sold on the idea that DAOs are going to completely revolutionize human coordination. Um, I think it's probably the most significant innovation in crypto. We've got the core primitives. I think DAOs are the end game. This is where we're all going. Um, and DAOs will wrap everything together, and that's why they're interesting. So just to give you a quick, um, for those of you who might not be familiar with quadratic voting, um, it's, it's basically voting squared. Um, it's the idea that you can vote more than once on something. So typically, you would end up with a kind of binary vote. If you go and vote on election day somewhere, you get, you get to put one tick in a box. Um, there's some other voting schemes like ranked choice voting and other these kind of things. And, and quadratic voting is one of 
what you might call an, an exotic voting scheme. It's exotic, it's in crypto, and people like Vitalik are super excited about it and have been excited about it since about 2018. Um, so have I, and I sort of built a quadratic voting app in about 2016, 2017, um, for use in universities to help people make decisions in there and stuff. But one of the major issues is that there's these issues of civil resistance, which again, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the idea is, is that you can vote more than once. So you can see over here, we've got like the square of the vote. So if you vote five times, you use 25 voting credits, if you like, or $25. The initial conception of quadratic voting was it basically allowed you to buy votes. Um, people get a little bit freaked out by the idea you can buy votes. It happens in the real world. Um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of elections are basically bought through things like super PACs and PR and all this kind of thing. Um, quadratic voting makes it very explicit. I think of it as connecting economics to governance. And it was initially designed to be what's called the tyranny of the majority. So the tyranny of the majority is basically the idea if, if you are in a minority context somewhere and the majority wants something to go their way, you are basically disempowered to the point where it's kind of tyranny, right? So if you're a minority voice in a large group, you can fall prey to the tyranny of the majority. And so quadratic voting was designed to, as a mechanism for allowing minority ideas, minority voices be heard in a democratic system. And I'm pretty convinced it's going to open up a huge new era in decentralized governance. And that's basically what I'm going to try and shield to you for the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, hands up, who's read Radical Markets? Yeah, good, good. Um, I recommend it. I think the, this book um, really got Vitalik quite excited in about 2018. And within it, it talks, it talks about a future where quadratic voting gets sort of integrated into a democracy and it sort of imagines uh, a future where not only quadratic voting, but also this idea of harbinger taxes, uh, which we also built a harbinger taxes app for liquidity mining. If anyone's interested in that, I'll show you later. Um, but harbinger taxes, uh, who's heard of harbinger taxes? Let me show of hands. Um, Old school token economics stuff um, got very, people got quite excited about this for NFTs and it's the idea that something is always on sale. So you say what the value of it is and someone can buy it at any moment, but taxes are generated by the person who's holding it. So you declare the value and taxes are generated on it. Anyway, so this imagines this future where we've got this wonderful pot of money that's generated from basically property and land that all goes into a central pot, and now you need to find a way to spend it in a kind of direct democracy. And quadratic voting is used in that idea um, as a way to, let's spend this money. We've got lots of, so instead of just voting once every four years for basically, I don't know, two or three parties, three parties if you're lucky, um, and largely sort of our democratic paradigm, if you like, is, is people only get a sort of, a weak vote once every four years. What, I, what myself and people like Vitalik and Glenn Whale are very interested in is what happens if you make voting more frequent and give people a more direct voice into the direction of, of societal governance, right? And, and that's what this idea is about. People did find the idea that you could buy votes really sort of upsetting. And one of the modifications that Glenn Whale proposes is what he calls modified quadratic voting. And that's the idea that every person gets a budget of voting power and you can spend it on what you care about um, throughout a sort of year. So you have these like sequential referenda. So you can imagine a vote on healthcare and a vote on anything that's coming up, gun rights or property, income taxes, whatever. And you can vote on the issues that you care about. So it's, and this I found was like really powerful idea. Like what if, democracy was more direct and you had a real say over the direction of things. Um, those of you, who's, who's uh, done any quadratic funding on Gitcoin? That's great, you should do that. Um, so Gitcoin, again, this idea comes out of the same, same principle. It's the idea that you can do something called quadratic funding where you can match fund things based on this quadratic 
um, power law thing. And, it, and that, that's what basically this is about. It's, it's almost like applying a bonding curve to governance and different ways of doing it. What you're voting on now, um, so if you go to vote.fberlin.oo, um, you'll see a screen with our voting app. If you haven't minted your SBT yet, you can do that at mint.fberlin.oo. Um, the Ether card thing, we did kind of discovered in practice here today that importing a new private key from seed from a seed phrase is not doesn't play very nicely with MetaMask. MetaMask doesn't like you let you do that basically. So the, the key to doing it is if you just create a new browser profile, um, if you just put like create a new profile in Brave or whatever um, uh, browser you're using, it gives you a fresh instance. You can reinstall MetaMask, import from Seed, and create a kind of burner profile for this weekend. And that's what we recommend you do. Um, so if you go and do that, you mint a, an identity, and that will allow you to vote. And we have a slightly different spin on quadratic voting. Um, it's got the it's kind of unsexy name of se semantic ballot voting. Um, but one of the issues that when I was thinking about this problem is, let's say you're voting on all these future referendum. People generally have a recency bias. So if you give people the opportunity to vote every month on something, they'll vote for what's happening this month. And then they'll run out of their voting power by the end. So anything late on won't get as many votes. So what we've done is compile all the options into a single ballot, and you have a budget of voting power that you can express over a list. So basically what this empowers you to do, and if you're thinking about decentralized governance design and DAOs, and if anyone's doing that, feel free to grab me for the rest of the day and talk about it, I'll do that forever. Um, and basically this allows people to sort a list. It's as simple as that you pass out a list of things we can do, and then what you get back is a consensus sorted list. Now, that sounds simple, but it's actually incredibly powerful. Most decent, who votes in DAOs? Has anyone voted in DAOs at the moment? You'll find most of it is based on sort of token weighted voting, right? So basically this means that anyone, the richest people run everything, and typically you are voting yes and no on something. And that is like the first iteration of DAO governance. There's a lot more to do on that. And a big part of it is providing an expressive outcome from a decentralized group of people. So just saying yes or no is a very limited kind of decision making. And it's not what you get normally in large decision making entities. You don't get kind of direct democracy every now and again where people say yes or no. There's a much more deliberative process. And that's what we're trying to create here. So if you look at this screen, you'll see a list of semantic tags and the opportunity to sort them based on quadratic voting. But you also get to leave a justification. So this also collects dialogue, which is not something that most of the voting systems do in DGov yet. You can vote and say why. And that allows you to do iterative voting. Um, and the goal of this, and I, I don't know if people might have heard of this concept of sense making, the idea of collective sense making is a governance paradigm where we kind of reach shared mental models. If you go into that voting screen, you'll see a vote. We've set up the live vote now for the hackathon, but we've also set up one on the values of this conference, which I just thought there's a wonderful manifesto for this conference, which is now what we're now voting on. Voting on values is a really powerful idea for DAOs because it allows you to express who you are as a collective and allowed you to find a community of people who are aligned with you. And that's what we've been trying to do, is to build a voting system that allows you to express identity as a collective. Um, so that's basically where we're at. Um, I might, if we have time at the end, throw some of the demos up of the voting app, but I'm just gonna sort of plow through this for now. Um, and for the rest of the day, well, for you, you've got till three o'clock to get your vote in for the hackathon. There's 10K riding on it, 10,000 10, DAI riding on that vote. So you want to vote. Um, and I'll hang around and help anyone doing it. Um, so that's what we've got, right? That's the basis. But what does that mean for DAOs? How does that change decentralized governance? What's the next era of decentralized governance? I'm very, very convinced that DAOs are going to lead the next major phase of crypto. 
I think DAOs are going to be the major narrative. I think they're going to start having real impact in the real world. Um, but to do that, we need to get better at governance. We need to get better at decentralized governance. Uh, it needs to not be just purely, purely plutocratic, as in the richest people run everything. Um, it needs to be deliberative, and it needs to be values-driven. And I think the route into that is NFT governance. So you can do this now. NFTs are just tokens like anything else. Um, but NF like NFTs are non-fungible, and we're non-fungible, right? So we are non-fungible humans. Normally, in a governance context, individuals and identity is a part of the governance process. So individuality is a key point of governance, and NFTs open this up. So we're non-fungible, so should our governance be. Um, and I'm very convinced this simple move from using fungible tokens, the non-fungible tokens for governance, is going to be a really important step forward uh, for DAOs. And why is that the case? Well, it allows us to represent identity. So as we've seen over the last couple of years, NFT people flex their JPEGs, right? Um, and what they're doing is building a pseudonymous identity. And it allows us to have an identity that can be an abstraction. It means it's the route to pseudo-anonymous identity. Uh, we don't want to be doxing ourselves, right? We, don't want, we want to be able to operate in these systems without it being you explicitly who that is. You need to be able to reify an identity online that's truly pseudonymous. Um, not only that, it allows you to do identity, right? So it allows you to do reputation. So we can attach any kind of metadata to this. So you can build up a profile of you over time and have it stored in an NFT that you can carry around with you. So this is like attestations of work. So you'll be able to take a history of participation in a DAO attached to an NFT and prove that you are a DAO participant that's worth having in the DAO. It also opens up the reputation layer. So another one of these things that's been hanging around in crypto since basically the, the very early days of Ethereum is the idea that you can have decentralized reputation that you can treat people differently based on a pseudonymous identity and have that be used in a decentralized system. And NFTs get us there. Um, who's heard of soulbound tokens? About half of you. Um, yeah, so um, Vitalik wrote an article not long ago called Soulbound. Um, and it's basically the idea that in, you have non-transferable NFTs. So if you're doing all this stuff where you're building decentralized identity with the NFTs, then it might be a problem if you can go and sell that in the open market, right? You've spent six months aggregating this powerful governance identity in a system, and then you just go and sell it on OpenSea or something. Now, it might not be the case that the people in that down know that you're different because it's pseudo-anonymous. So SBTs allow you to have much more assurances around who, who people are. So it's not transfer, non-transferable tokens, essentially. And this changes the game for governance because it removes the financialization out of the picture a little bit. So we all saw the sort of like ape JPEG frenzy over the last couple of years, and it turned into this like hyper-financialized game. And that's not really the basis for a good governance system. Um, and more recently, Glenn Whale, Radical Markets author, um, collaborated with Vitalik and another researcher to create uh, this decentralized society idea, DSOC. Um, and th that's kind of the basis of that is to use these tokens to build sociality, to build online systems that can be genuinely like social. And a big part of that is about civil resistance. Um, we're in what I call the civil war. Um, you don't know who you're talking to online, generally. Um, I think this is actually a far bigger problem. People are very onto it in Web3 and crypto, but it's actually a far bigger problem on Web2. Um, we have no idea how much of Twitter is controlled by a small number of people. We know that there's bot farms out there. There's no, we know there's click farms that operate tens of thousands of Twitter accounts with the intention of manipulating public opinion. And that's, what is a, that's a Sybil attack, right? That's one, one actor pretending to be lots of people. Um, so it's, it's bad in Web 2 because you can start to manipulate public opinion, make, you can astroturf Twitter,
make it look like things are bigger than they really are. And we know that people are influenced by this stuff. But in crypto, there's money at stake, right? There's, 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 it can be a real problem, and it breaks quadratic voting. Um, so SB, SBTs are a way to get around that. It stops people able, being, being able to just buy lots of accounts, buy lots of NFTs, and take over a DAO. Now, I'm going to make a fairly bold statement here. I think this is one of the most civil resistant votes of all time. Um, if you think about it, how did you get that SBT if you've just minted one? You were carefully selected to be part of this hackathon. Um, we know you're an individual person. You were handed a physical card on the way in. It's very unlikely that many of you have managed to acquire any more than one vote on this. I think it's probably like that's not all you need to do to go and civil attack a general election is convince whoever's in the uh, room to give you more than one vote. Um, you know, I, I went and voted in the recent general election in the UK, and I just pointed to my name on a list and was given a pen. Right? That, that's as how civil resistant a general election is. So I think there's, this is a kind of interesting voting thing we've done here. Um, I actually saw a WorldCoin orb earlier. I wasn't dreaming, was I? Um, but yeah, people are wondering about civil resistance and, and attaching biometric identity. I'm not a fan. Uh, I think there's a big danger of attesting your physical identity to an SBT because you can't get rid of them, right? It's, you don't want to pick up bad reputation and then be stuck with it forever. If you hashed your eyeballs to it, it might be irreversible, and that's a bit worrying. Anyway, um, so those of you who've actually gone and done this vote, um, put the time in on that values vote that's on there for ETH Berlin and think about which values... Take, find 10 minutes later on today if you haven't done that vote already and do the justifications vote and you might find it has an impact on the way that you think, right? So there's a really important concept called like critical reflection and I think these tools promote it. And by that, I mean, I think they're a cognitive technology, right? So cognitive technologies are tools that influence the way you think. Um, they upgrade your brain um, and what we're trying to do is build voting systems that upgrade our brains. They actually make you think more. You don't know what your preferences are until you ask to express them. Now, asking you to express your preferences with a weighting system really makes you think. And if you, you, you'll find that doing one of these votes properly takes you probably like 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, I would advise just think about it. like go and spend some time, put some time into it, um, and you'll... And, and reflect on how it's in, impacting your, your thought process. It's generally quite interesting. All right. Any more questions from the round? I'm going once. I'm going twice. Ka-ching! Sold. Thank you very much, Dr. Nick. Thank you All right. Much. Please give him a big round of applause.